Good evening, church. I uh, asked Pastor John if I could just uh, share a few words, and there are a, some things that I am asking you to pray about, uh, but some of the realities um, of our day and uh, that are happening in the prison where I work. And uh, in the last... <coughs> In the last three to four weeks, we've had uh, six inmates overdose on drugs, and one died. The company has had, uh, so this is not something unique to just here, but any correctional facility today across the country, I'm sure, is facing the same thing. We had a uh, correctional officer commit suicide up in Colorado, one of the facilities there, a man who served as an officer for 18 years. But what's the heaviest on my heart is we had uh, down uh, in Texas a chaplain that I believe he probably was a Seventh-day Adventist, was preaching at uh, a church in Mexico, right across the border from, I believe, Laredo. And uh, one of the drug cartels broke into the service, took him hostage, and executed him. And uh, just in the class that I had today, I'm finding that the, uh, the amount of drugs has more than doubled coming across the border since the first of the year. In our facility, it just seems like it's coming in and nothing seems to be able to stop it. Uh, the, part of the reason why this is happening at our facility is because we've held on to inmates longer than they've, they are usually here. We usually get them for short periods of time, but the longer they're here, the longer they have to learn the patterns in the facility and to figure out ways to get contraband into the facility. Coupled with that, the current staff is continually putting in 16-hour days, and they are very, very fatigued. And we're trying the very best to hire people, and not just us. You can drive down by GEO down there, and they're hiring um, our training officer just graduated a class of 25 last week on Friday. Two have already quit. Um, so the stress and the pressure and the damage that's being done is absolutely incredible. So I would just simply ask you to keep correctional officers in general. If you know one, pray specifically for them. Pray for their strength. And I guess, you know, it's a war that's going on there, spiritual warfare for sure. And, uh, and yet the, the drugs that are coming in that are, are just overwhelming, not just inside a prison, but in our communities as well. Um, so that's a burden on my heart, and I just ask that you might make that a matter of prayer. Um, in your daily prayers, just remember that. And I'd like to open us tonight in prayer, too. So let's, let's pray. Father, the things that are going on in, in our world today are not a secret to you. You see all. You know all. It comes sometimes as a surprise to us that these things are going on. And we have... Sometimes we confess we have a tendency to bury our heads in the sand and ignore things. And we confess that we feel helpless, maybe to change anything. So, Father, I, I just invite your presence here tonight that you would speak to us through your word. Anoint Pastor John to bring forth the message that we need to hear tonight, Lord. 
and embolden us all with the power of your Holy Spirit to be the spiritual people and the spiritual warriors that we need to be in the day in which we're living. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Welcome. Good to see each of you tonight. Good to see each of you joining us online. We thank you for joining us online. It's good to see you. Thank you for sharing those things. I will be diligent in my prayers for, you know, I know we have several in our own church who work in, in that industry. You know, and I imagine you as a chaplain, I can only imagine the burden you hold for them, you know, as they're stressed, as they're dealing with this increase in drugs because I assume you're not just the chaplain to the prisoners, but also to the staff, you know, also to the staff. And so I can only imagine the burden you must carry for them dealing with this. So you are in our prayers as well as you lead them, as you minister to them. Well, I'm glad each of you are here tonight. So good to see you. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to close our series tonight on spiritual disciplines. I didn't know if last week would be the last one, but uh, tonight I think will be the last one. Um, I was just looking through my notes, and there's one I found that I don't think we've talked about yet, spiritual disciplines, and that is fellowship. That is fellowship. We did talk about worship uh, several weeks, maybe even several months now ago. Um, we talked about worship, and, and part of what we talked about had to do with corporate worship, and that might flow into the fellowship topic. But uh, tonight we'll be on fellowship, the spiritual discipline of fellowship. So what is a spiritual discipline? I know uh, we, uh, we have some faces that, uh, and maybe some online that haven't been here uh, recently on a Wednesday night. What is the definition of a spiritual discipline? Anybody have any ideas those who've been here any ideas those of you online love to hear your thoughts what is the definition of a spiritual discipline somebody was paying attention i know it but it's been a while and you can use your own words to define it. any thoughts anybody have a a definition and you can just raise your hand repeat it in the microphone Sure. Intentional practice designed to draw one closer to God. That's good. Intentional practice designed to draw one closer to God. That is from uh, Richard over here. Oh, we got another one up on the screen. Spiritual disciplines are habits, practices, experiences that are designed to develop, grow, and strengthen certain qualities of spirit to build the muscles of one's character and expand the breadth of one's inner life. Another great definition. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Good stuff. Well, glad you're here. So tonight we're talking about the spiritual discipline of fellowship Going back to the Greek word that we translate to mean fellowship, uh, koinonia. Perhaps I'm saying that wrong. That's the Greek word, koinonia, which refers to the concept of fellowship. It's a joint participation. It's this idea of sharing with one another. It's a gift that is jointly contributed. It is a collection. It is a contribution. Fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. And we believe as Christians, when we're talking about Christian fellowship, is that fellowship is more than hanging out. You know, it's more than church potluck. Sometimes we say we're going to have fellowship at the church potluck. And that's true. We are having fellowship at the church potluck. But it is more than that. It would imply, Christian fellowship would imply that there is a deep sense of bonding going on and that we are, in fact, strengthening each other spiritually by our mutual encouragement, by sharing stories, by praying for each other. Do we have anything online, Tom? Oh, okay, sorry. 
So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. You ever read Hebrews? Who's read Hebrews? It's a good book. It's a good book. Hebrews chapter 10, just a couple verses here. Verses 24 and 25. Do we have those? Here's what the Bible tells us. It says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. So what is the context here? What is going on? There's a group of Christians, uh, perhaps they were Jewish Christians, if I'm remembering right, and uh, they are perhaps in danger of their initial Christian faith, their initial attraction to Christ dwindling away, dwindling away. There's persecution happening, and so it was, uh, it was, it was said, some have said, in the context here, uh, that there were Christians who were considering going back to Judaism, considering going back to that works-based religion. Why would they do that? Because of persecution. Because of the persecution that is happening here. And so the author of the book of Hebrews is encouraging, exhorting, um, trying to get these people to hang out with each other to fellowship with each other, to be there for each other, because out in the world, outside of the church, there was lots of persecution happening. So the application here in this passage, the application here is that mutual encouragement is crucial to helping these Christians make a full commitment to their faith. And we can go one step further as Christians tonight. We can take it one step further and apply this to our own lives. That mutual encouragement is vital. It's crucial to have that in your life. And that is why we are calling fellowship a spiritual discipline. And maybe you've never thought of fellowship as a spiritual discipline. You know, typically when we think of a spiritual discipline, we'll think of prayer, we'll think of maybe fasting, we'll think of tithing, you know, we'll think of... Uh, different things like that, reading, reading scripture, attending church. But do we consider fellowship, just the concept of fellowship, to be a discipline that God calls us to pursue in our lives? No right answer there, but in my opinion, I think it is. I think there's enough uh, scripture, there's enough said in God's word uh, to imply that fellowship is something that is important. Fellowship is something that is vital, and fellowship is something that should be a spiritual discipline, a spiritual practice, a spiritual habit in our lives. And if you disagree, we can argue after church. It's okay if you disagree, by the way. All right, so uh, the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 10, it uses this concept of spurring one another on spurring one another on. Uh, and that's a Greek word, comes from a Greek word uh, that's used to describe inciting something. Inciting something, like you'd light a match and there's the flame. Spurring each other on. You know, it's interesting. Um, if you lit a stick on fire, and maybe you've done this before, maybe you've grabbed a twig or a small stick and you've lit it on fire, it's kind of hard, first of all, to just light one stick on fire. But when you do, uh, it burns a little bit, but it, it often doesn't burn very long. Has anybody ever done that? It often doesn't burn very long. It kind of burns out. Um, but it's interesting, and maybe you've made a campfire before. Maybe you've made a campfire before. When you gather a bunch of sticks together and put a bunch of sticks around each other and then light all of the sticks on fire, the flame burns much brighter, the flame burns much hotter, and most importantly, the flame burns quite a bit longer, quite a bit longer. All of the sticks burning together keeps each one of those individual sticks burning longer, brighter, and hotter. And I was just thinking about that today. It's a, it's a very good parallel to our Christian lives, you know. If you leave a Christian by himself or herself in isolation, and maybe we've been doing some of that lately, this past year, maybe we've experienced some isolation this past year, if you leave a Christian long enough in isolation, it is unlikely 
uh, they will grow spiritually. It could still happen. It could still happen. God can do all things, but it is unlikely to happen, in my opinion. From my experience, for people to grow spiritually, they have to be around other Christians. In my experience, for people to grow spiritually, they must be around other Christians. Not just doing potlucks at church, but actually praying for each other, actually encouraging each other, actually, you know, if there's, if there's something somebody's struggling with or if somebody's gone off the path, correcting them out of love back onto the right path. Um, and, and, and just like sticks around a campfire, I think that we're the sticks as Christians. And the more sticks you put on the fire, the more sticks you put on there, the longer and hotter the fire will burn. And maybe you've ever, have you ever been to a big bonfire? It's so hot you can barely even get close and it just burns and burns. Sometimes it burns all night, you know. Sometimes it burns all night. The more sticks you put on the fire, the longer and hotter the fire will burn. And it's the same with the Christian life. If you surround yourself with other Christians, your flame for Christ will burn longer and it will burn hotter. It will burn longer, it will burn hotter. Verse 24 tells us, if we want to pull that up real quick. Verse 24 tells us, um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. New Living Translation uses the word motivate. Um, And what are we supposed to be motivating each other to? It says it right there. It says it right there. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to, number one, acts of love, number two, good works. Now, it's interesting because when you hang out with somebody who's truly loving, if you surround yourself with people who are truly loving, I think it is likely that you are going to pick up on some of those tendencies, right? I think it's uh, likely, just like anything else, you will pick up on some of those tendencies. If you hang out with people who treat people well, who treat you well, who treat others well, it's likely that you will probably treat people well or at least move in that direction. Same with good works, you know. If you surround yourself with people who are anxious to, to help out, to do good works, to show love, I think it is likely that uh, you will grow in that area as well. And so if this is true, if this is true, then I think fellowship is an important spiritual discipline. If this is true, I think, I think fellowship is an important spiritual discipline because we know that by having real Christian fellowship, we will actually be spurred on. We will actually motivate one another towards acts of love and good works. And that's what God wants for us. And so God did not call us to live the Christian life alone. You know, many of us have been dealing with this concept of isolation the last 12 months or so, you know, and it's uh, doable for a very short time, but if we do it too long, we're going to notice it, you know, and and I I do think there's ways to fellowship uh, from a distance. I mean, I think there are with technology. However, it's hard to actually get in the habit of doing that. I think many of us, um, instead of being proactive in that digital sort of fellowship, that distance sort of fellowship, I think many of us fell into isolation. Maybe you can relate. I think many of us fell into isolation over the past 12 months. Now, there's all sorts of options to uh, engage with people over technology. But do we do it? Fellowship. It's very important. Verse 25 tells us, if we want to fast forward, verse 25 tells us to... uh, read out of the New Living here, tells us to not neglect our meeting together. To not neglect our meeting together. As some people do. Some, some, some people were. They were afraid of persecution. Some people were. But to encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now remember, they were living in a culture where there was lots of persecution, and so it was very vital. It was very vital that they gathered regularly to, uh, to fellowship, to encourage each other. It was very vital. Collective and corporate worship is a vital part of spiritual life. Collective and corporate worship is a vital part of spiritual life. 
I know many of us here tonight, many of us in our church, we learned this year just how difficult it is to remain connected to the church without regular physical presence. Did you deal with that the past 12 months? Many of us did. We learned just how difficult it is to remain connected to the church, to remain connected to other Christians without having that constant and regular physical presence. I know many of us worshiped online. I know many of us, uh, or, or, or at least at the beginning, we worshiped online. All of us did. And uh, if, we go, if we do that too long, we just get out of the habit of, of fellowshipping. We just get out of the habit. It is difficult to remain connected to each other without constant physical presence. It is possible if you, if you do it diligently, but it is difficult. Does anybody have something they want to share, uh, a story you want to share, um, an experience you want to share over the past 12 months where you felt isolated? Um, any, any, any thoughts on that? Anybody want to share your experience the last 12 months? Yeah, I'll get you the mic here. Chaplain's always got to say something here, doesn't he? I think for me, um, the um, Mosaic Men's Group uh, base camp has been one of the things that has kept me going. Um, even when we were just meeting um, on Zoom, um, I would say probably the, the core group, we don't have everybody that was a year ago a part of that group, but... Um, We've got a core group of guys that, that stayed faithful, even when uh, some were traveling uh, to other places. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's helped me. I'm thinking it's helped everybody else that's been a part of that. So yeah. uh, I know that some, you know, are not uh, necessarily happy. You know, some are, quote, zoomed out. <laughs> uh, and I understand how that can happen. Um, and I probably am not the greatest techie in the world myself, so um, and neither were some of the other guys because we did experience problems when we first uh, tried to do this. But um, I think everyone recognized that it was a blessing to be able to do that. Um, not necessarily that we want to continue to do that, but that during the period of time where we had to do that, it was a real blessing yeah. to be able to. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, zoomed out. That's I, I guess people are using that terminology. I haven't heard that, but yeah, zoomed out. Yeah, I think uh, you know, just from my just from my perspective, uh, the men's the men's group did a phenomenal job at staying connected digitally. You know, I mean, I mean, really so. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's different than being physically present together, but there's there's still there still was definitely lots of fellowship, right? There really was. Um, yeah, we all learned a little bit about technology, <laughs> you know, this past 12 months. Um, we were forced to, right? Um, I thought it was a miracle in our own church when our, uh, in our April board meeting was totally on Zoom, and I couldn't believe every single one of them figured out Zoom the very first time. They figured out Zoom, they were on there, they were talking. Uh, I was not anticipating that. I was like, there's going to be so many technical difficulties, but the Lord uh, carried us through, and uh, <laughs> we had a church board meeting purely over Zoom, and I thought, I thought that was a small miracle. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else want to share regarding this past 12 months and just the isolation uh, or um, isolation or, you know, the, the way you were able to fellowship, uh, you, you know, from a distance uh, this, this past 12 months? Any, uh, any, any thoughts on that? I did have, there is one comment online that uh, we missed. It, Melanie says, growing up loving campfires, she loves the, the image that you presented with the campfire. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. Good to see you on here tonight. Wonderful. Any thoughts before I move on? Anybody want to share how these past 12 months have impacted you, you know, being in isolation or semi-isolation, you know, or, or isolation from your typical fellowship? Because I know that even though we're not locked in our homes 24-7, I know that many things that we like that have to do with fellowship have maybe gotten canceled, you know, the, this past 12 months. Um, so anybody want to share? I think for me, it hasn't really affected me too much because uh, 
for a year and a half now, I want to say, I've been on in online school before COVID even started. And I've kind of hunkered down and, you know, been in my own isolation. But with these la last 12 months, what really kind of stopped me from fellowshipping and being a part of the church is before I started becoming part of the sound team was the fact that the youth group was kind of slowing down and not becoming a thing anymore. And I couldn't be connected much anymore. Yeah. And even though I still went to regular service, you know, I, and I still felt connected, but something just felt off. And, you know, and now that everything's kind of slowed back down and opened back up, uh, it feels normal again, but there's, it's still trying to be pieced back together yeah. from the amount of time that pe businesses, buildings, everything has been shut down. It, it comes down to, like, from my experience that some, uh, I think some companies might not survive the close. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad uh, this place survived because I don't know what I'd do without it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I can uh, definitely relate to what you said. Yeah, and I was just thinking as you were speaking, it's almost like you're trying to play catch up. It's like you, you miss certain things and it's like you're just trying to get all of it you can because you miss it so much. Yeah. Do we have another comment? Go. So I think for me in the beginning when everything started to slow down, I was going through my own grief. So um, it was kind of nice to be alone, isolated, not being involved with a whole bunch. It was kind of like a break. But after the month started to continue on, things were still shut down. You're still not able to gather as a group, you know, small groups. No swimming during the summer. That killed me. Um, I'm glad things are coming back, but I think for me personally, the fear is still there. Um, I don't want to catch it. I've seen what it's done already to so many, and I don't want to have to go through that. So I still have a lot of fear. Yeah, yeah fair point. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys for sharing. That's uh yeah, I mean, we're, we're in this together, and uh, I think we've all had uh, <laughs> we've all had some kind of experience this past 12 months, some kind of uh, experience that's not normal, you know, this past 12 months. And uh, yeah, yeah, for me, as a technology guy, it's been busier than normal. So. <laughs> yeah, you're working more than ever, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true, though, right? I mean, that you see certain industries that have, you know, just gone exponential, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's impacted everybody different, you know. Um, and uh, being a technology guy here, it's probably a little bit different, at least for the beginning when everything was online, you know, it's just kind of, uh, yeah, it's impacted all of us, yeah. Yeah, trying to put together a outdoor service, and then when we went online, trying to get it so everybody can see the words, and, you know, just yeah. on top of it, kept, that kept me busy, too. Well, you did a great job. I watched a lot of um, other churches, um, and I was like, wow, our sound quality is so much better. So thank you. That was good. That was good. Well, let, let, let's take a look uh, at First Thessalonians chapter five. Oh, I'm sorry. Verses uh, eight through eleven. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses eight through eleven. Perfect. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Verse nine. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that, whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. Here's verse 11. So, encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. And if you're not already doing it, start doing it, right? All right, go back to verse 10 if you would. Um, verse 10 tells us that Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Um, it's interesting, as Christians, as those who have received salvation, as those who have made a commitment to follow Jesus, the truth is we're stuck together. You know, the truth is we're stuck together. You are stuck with this Christian family. Isn't that scary? You are stuck 
with this Christian family, and there's nothing you can do about it, even if there's somebody you don't like. And I know you like everybody at church, right? Everybody. Even if there's somebody who you don't like, but it gets even worse. It gets even worse because not only are you stuck with them now, you're stuck with them for eternity. You ever thought about that? So if there's somebody in the church you don't like, you're stuck with them for eternity. That makes Melanie happy because she said, uh, <laughs> as hunger, as huggers, we are starving. Oh, with social distancing. Oh, I know. And a lot of people do. They like hugging or handshaking. It's interesting how handshaking is like not a cultural norm, at least right now anymore. And it's like, well, hopefully that comes back, right? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, the, tr- the truth is, uh, and not everybody is a hugger, and maybe you don't, maybe you don't like huggers. I don't know. But um, the truth is um, we're stuck with each other for eternity, you know? And, uh, and yeah, it's funny, but, but, but the truth is we have to learn to get along with each other. We have to learn to get along with each other. Um, so go to verse 11 where the Bible says, Therefore... Therefore, or at least this translation, this one says so. It says so, encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So what are you supposed to do (laughs) to everybody, even those who you don't like, even those who annoy you, even those who have different political opinions than you do? Bible says encourage each other, build each other up just as you are already doing. Um, If you're going to be stuck with somebody for eternity, you better try to help them become the best person they could possibly be. Now, um, but, but, but that is the truth, you know. Um, I think God wants us to get along. When we talk about fellowship, making a spiritual discipline, I think God wants us to get along. And we're not going to click with everybody. Just that, that might be a personality thing. We're not going to necessarily click with everybody, but we should be, we should be building each other up. We should be encouraging each other, even those who we don't really connect with on a political level or other levels, even those who we clash heads on certain uh, styles of worship or whatever it is we clash heads on, we should still be encouraging. We should still be building up. We shouldn't sit on the other side of the church and avoid that person. We should be encouraging them because they're going to be in, they're going to be in heaven with us, right? We should be encouraging them. And so, um, Fellowship is important, and, and, and there's passages all over Scripture that kind of point to the importance, that point to the importance of fellowship, that it should be, perhaps, it should be a spiritual discipline. It should be something that we are disciplined doing. And for many of us, it takes discipline to engage with people who we don't really connect with, you know? It takes discipline for us to engage with people who maybe we don't really like. You know, maybe we got in an argument with them years ago, months ago, and um, we just don't, aren't really talking. Um, it takes discipline and it takes maturity to actually proactively go out and encourage that person, go out and make things right with that person, to build that person up. Um, and that's, but, but that's who we are as Christians. That's who we are as the church. We shouldn't hang out in our own cliques. We shouldn't hang out with just the people who we know or who we connect with at church. We should be a fellowship of all believers, you know, of all different ages and backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. And we should be intentional to go out of our way, to go out of our way to encourage each other and build each other up. This is important. I'm going to jump to Ecclesiastes, or should I say jump back to Ecclesiastes. How many of you have read the book of Ecclesiastes? It's a a good one, isn't it? It's a very unique book. Um, Many words of wisdom. Uh, We're going to look at chapter 4. We're going to look at chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. This is, uh, this is just practical wisdom right here. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble, no doubt. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Is not easily broken. You know, I don't know that there's a huge, deep theological meaning here. This is just common sense, right? This is just common sense. You know, God created us to be together, God created us to be in fellowship 
with each other. It's how God wired us. Even those who would claim to be introverts, you know, we're still wired, you know, to some degree, to some degree, to have some kind of connection. God created us to be together. God created us to have companionship, to have fellowship, to have people who we do life with. God created us to have family, to have the church. Verse 12 uses the analogy of a rope or a cord. And uh, if you've ever looked closely at how a rope is made, you know it's made, uh, many ropes, not all ropes, many ropes are made by uh, tinier, tinier ropes, right? Braided together, braided together. And uh, see, what you'll see sometimes is um, a very thin rope hold a lot of weight. You ever seen that? A very thin rope hold a lot of weight. And you think, how is that possible? Well, it's, by the way, the rope is designed. It's braided in such a way. It's weaved in such a way where the different strands are weaved together. And those different strands weaved together makes the rope exponentially stronger. It makes it exponentially stronger having that design. Similar concept, really, to the campfire and the sticks. You know, the more sticks you have, the fire gets exponentially bigger than just one. Same with the rope. The more uh, braids and strands you have, you know, wrapped together like that, the rope becomes thicker and thicker and thicker, the stronger the rope is. And that's an analogy we can use for the Christian life, right? Um, having people in our lives, um, not being alone, not living life alone, uh, is, is not easily broken. It's not easily broken. Um, we are going to be much stronger Christians if we live the Christian life together with each other. We are going to be much stronger Christians if we live the Christian life intentionally with each other uh, than living it alone. Much stronger, exponentially stronger. And you see, you've probably seen this in your life. And if you do, feel free to raise your hand and share. You've probably seen this in your life. Um, maybe, maybe you saw it when you went through a, you know, a rough season, a season of loss, a season of con confusion, a season where you didn't know what was going on, a season of God, don't know what's going on, help me. Um, a season of tragedy. And, and maybe you had people surround you, you had other Christians surround you, and that's what brought you through. You know, So that loss, that tragedy, whatever it is that you went through, it would have destroyed you if you were by yourself. But the fact that you had Christians praying for you, surrounding you, fellowshipping with you, it brought you through. Does anybody have something they want to share? Feel free. I know many of us have stories. Do you have something? Thank you. Go for it. I think on your comment where you said uh, on this m moment of loss, having Christians around you help build someone back up, I can relate um, just recently. And recently we had a, I had a niece die. Um, and I, with everyone in this church helping me stand and keep up, and keep fighting, and one day, hopefully, I can see her again up in heaven, and, I, and that's what I plan to do, and, but he, with that loss, in the beginning, it does bring a lot of sadness, but having a bunch of Christians surround you, and lift you back up, and tell you that everything's going to be okay, you're going to see her again, that is what pushed me to believe that she may be gone, but I will be seeing her again, and that's what's keeping me going and not down. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's powerful. That's powerful. I used to use this analogy when I would uh, talk to people about coming to church and stuff, and and you know, I was into football quite a bit at that time, but basically, I. You know, it's like Sunday is like when you get together, you're all together in one church. It's like the football on offense. They get together in a huddle, yeah. and they make their plan for the next play. And I think of coming to the church is like making, you know, making that plan for the next week, for getting the encouragement and the strength. And, you know, when you break from that huddle, you all give each other a high five and, you know, and encourage one another to, to go, to lead on. And it's like, that's, that's important that we, we, 
we do that with one another to help us get it true each week. Yeah, that's a good analogy. I like that, you know, and it's so true. Um, it, it, that, that is part of what church is, right, is uh, encouraging each other. And, and, and from that encouragement, we are all motivated, right? We are all motivated. Um, and, and so I think when we come to church on Sunday, we, we should feel motivated. Um, we should, uh, as we sing praises to God, as we pray, as we open up God's word, we should feel motivated to go out and live the Christian life with, with each other, you know? Thank you. That's, I like that analogy. I might use that sometime in a, in a sermon. Okay. You have my permission. And we're gonna, <laughs> and we're gonna, I'll put our hands in, go mosaic church. I like that. <laughs> Sounds good. And then we're going to dump a big thing of Gatorade on somebody. I don't know. Hopefully it's not me. What? <laughs> it's always the coach. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's look at Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen. You've heard this verse before. Maybe you have. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Um, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You know, it is difficult to grow without being challenged to grow. It's difficult to grow without someone challenging you to grow. It is difficult to know how to grow without someone who knows you well and who you trust willing to point out areas of growth for you. It's possible because the Holy Spirit will do that, right? Holy Spirit does that. But it is difficult sometimes to know how to grow without someone who knows you well and who you trust willing to point out areas of growth for you, right? So the Bible here encourages relationships that are centered on sharpening each other. Kind of going back to what, it, what does fellowship really mean, you know? Is it just the church potlucks? The Bible here encourages relationships that are centered on sharpening each other. Um, and so I think that part of fellowship uh, should be some, some sharpening, should be some sharpening. You know, we should have moments, we should have people who can just help us out, speak truth to us when we're wandering off the Christian path, who can nudge us lovingly in the right direction. This, this is what we should do with each other as the church. This is what we should do with each other as the church. This is fellowship. I'm going to read one more passage, I think. We're running out of time. Acts chapter 2. Anybody read Acts chapter 2? Early church, early Christian church. They were pretty radical, at least, you know, compared to us sometimes. Acts chapter 2, 44 through 47. You ready for this? Here's what it says. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I like how that translation uses the word fellowship there. That's good. Okay, so this is an interesting definition, example of fellowship, isn't it? You know, we read this and we think, wow, that's pretty unique. So this passage here implies, it, it's not implying that the early Christians lived in a commune. It's not implying that they, you know, pooled and redistributed everything equally. It's not, we're not talking about socialism here. Rather, this passage implies that they held their own possessions lightly. They were ready to use their possessions at a moment's notice to help someone in need. That's what this, that's what this pastor is talking about here. You know, it's a, it's a call. Um, it was a call for them to view their possessions as a blessing of God and always be willing to help when a need arises. The Bible says, the Bible says um, in verse uh, 46, 47, the Bible says they met every day 
in the temple courts. Every day. Can you imagine going to church every day? <laughs> every day they met in the temple courts. And uh, we know that the believers, typically, they did three things when they went to the temple courts. They did three things. Okay? Number one, they went there to worship, to praise God. Number two, they went there to pray. Number three, they went there to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that the Christians broke bread together. Uh, we see that in uh, 46 and 47. They broke bread together at each other's homes. Um, this translation uses, uses uh, the terminology, the Lord's Supper. Uh, but the idea is they were fellowshipping with each other, uh, perhaps daily. Perhaps daily, they were fellowshipping with each other. Their lives were centered around the church. Their lives were centered around fellowship. There was no TVs back then, you know. There was no, uh, there was no soccer practice or TVs or, or other types of media to distract them. Uh, you know, you'd go home, you'd work during the day, you'd go home, you'd eat some dinner, and uh, you'd have your evenings. And these Christians, they spent their evenings doing what? Many times fellowshipping with each other. They were like a family. Their lives were centered around the church. Their lives were centered around fellowship. So many of them had jobs. Uh, they went, they worked during the day. But after they got off work, it was not uncommon with, for them uh, to fellowship with each other. So, uh, I mean, culture was different back then. I'm not saying we have to mimic it exactly, but, you know, take a look at that passage and think, well, that's what the early church did. Maybe there's a way we could start to move in that direction as a church when it comes to fellowship. What would that look like? What would that look like? Anybody have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? On that passage, on any, any other passage, on the concept of fellowship? Anybody want to share uh, how the Lord's leading them to engage more in fellowship? Um, anybody want to share what's worked well for you in terms of fellowship in your life? How you've been able to stay connected? How you've been able to have that iron sharpens iron experience in your life? Any, any closing thoughts or any closing things you want to share? Got the mic over here. Oh, right. we'll go. We'll go here. Then we'll go here. Perfect. On the iron sharpens iron analogy, what keeps me with faith? One of the biggest things is having friends that genuinely aren't gonna drag me down. When I went to Coolidge High, I had friends who dragged me down constantly. When I left, I threw them away. I didn't need them. Recently, I have a friend who actually builds me up and uh, keeps me on a good path. My parents are the ones who keep me on the path of the Lord, and I love them dearly for that, and I'm really glad that they do keep me on this path, because if I wasn't on this path, I'd be a totally different person, <laughs> and I'm glad that they kept me on this path. When I hear the scripture, iron sharpens iron, the Lord told me he wanted me to go to Costa Rica, and I had no idea what he had in mind, and I ended up down there, and, and this one missionary from Peru, we befriended each other, and he said, I know why you're here, the Quebecer Indians are asking for a Christian to come in the jungle, and and help them. So I realized that's why God sent me. And and Dr. Antonio, this this pastor that befriended me, he just had a heart attack the year before, and he was having to take two-hour lunch breaks and take naps and everything. And he sees the spirit of God moving on some idiot that's called from Wyoming to Costa Rica. He decides he's going to go. And so we got down the jungle, tagged up with one of the Indians and started in. And we hadn't gone a mile or so and we had to stop and Antonio had to catch his breath and rest. And 
this kept happening where we couldn't go very far and he was struggling and and we were on a journey that was 20 miles into the jungle and Antonio was taking a break on a log sitting there and he told me this you know I'm sort of patting myself on the back that I even had the spiritual courage to go down there and go into the jungle and Antonio said, Rob, every time we stop, I tell God, my heart is hurting, I must go home. And God says, go farther. And he said, I just now told God, I can't go any farther. And God said, go farther. And he said, would you tell Renee where you bury me? And he got up and started walking into the jungle farther. That probably rasped me harder, sharpened me more than anything to see somebody older than I was that knew that this was going to kill him, but God wanted him to do it. And all his concern was, tell my wife where you bury me. Those kind of spiritual sharpenings that change you forever do not happen outside of the fellowship with Christians. Sometimes God might use an atheist donkey to talk to you, but that's a different blessing. And I just praise God for my, my fellowship with my brothers and sisters that spiritually keep me alive. Yeah, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that story. That's powerful. Wow. Amen. I just want to add to the story, and that is simply that I think the iron sharpening the iron happens when believers are on mission. Yes. Yeah. Most often. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I, I I'd agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap up here tonight? Thank you all for sharing. That was some really good conversation. That was some really good, uh, all of you, thank you for sharing. That was powerful. Um, uh, you know, my hope, my prayer um, is that we can leave here tonight and we can be motivated of the importance of fellowship, the importance of iron sharpens iron, the importance of um, encouraging each other, lifting each other up, and just... Let that be our prayer. God, how can you use me um, to encourage somebody else at the church? Maybe there's a, a way that you want to use me this week. May our prayer be, God, lead me further and further into Christian fellowship. Continue to sharpen me. Continue to use the believers around me uh, to grow me uh, closer to you. May that be our prayer. May that be our goal as we leave tonight. Let's pray together as we leave. Uh, Father, we bow before you, Lord, and we pray that you would work in each and every one of our lives tonight. God, we pray that you'd show us how to move forward in fellowship. We pray that you'd show us how we can really, really, really make fellowship a spiritual discipline in our lives. God, I pray tonight that you'd convince us the importance of fellowship. But not only that, God, I pray tonight that you'd speak to each one of us individually. Speak to each one of us individually, God, and show us how we can be in our own lives more disciplined in the area of fellowship. I pray, God, tonight that you would do a great work in each of our lives and that you would make it very clear and that you would open doors, that you'd lead people to each one of us tonight, God who we can continue to fellowship with, who we can uh, have the iron sharpens iron relationship with. Lead us in this area, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. We'll see you Sunday or next week. We'll see you again very soon. <laughs>